Hey guys, today's video is gonna be a bit more of a serious video in which I'm gonna be focusing a little bit on mental health and having a chat about the role of the cognitive functions might play in that. But before we dive in, I'm super, super excited to introduce to you guys this channel's very first sponsor, Voss Health. Voss is a new app for your mental health that is available worldwide in over eight different languages. It was developed with the help of mental health professionals and is a complex tool that will help you increase productivity, feel better, and get in touch with your inner self. The app offers daily mood tracking, affirmations, breathing exercises, and a journal function where you get to answer a question every day about yourself. I'd been doing this one question a day thing even before I heard about Voss Health in this nifty little journal that I used to carry around. Now I've got a portable version that I can carry around so I can check in on my mental headspace when I'm waiting for the train, waiting for my food to arrive, or just when I'm overwhelmed by the environment, which albeit doesn't happen very often because I'm an SE user. I found that the simple aesthetic layout of the app makes it really easy to use. And I especially love that it's a self-focused app. So there's no element of comparing yourself to others. Cause let's be real, there's way too much of that going on on the other apps. The really good news is that this app now has a free version so that everyone can try the guided journaling and mood tracking features and a more special premium version, which will help to connect all of your data and help you to see the bigger picture of your life. So thank you so much to Voz Health for sponsoring this video. And you guys can jump down to the link in my description to check that app out for yourself, which I highly recommend. So just a quick disclaimer before I begin this video, in this video, I'm gonna be talking about mental health, vaguely addressing emotional and psychological wounds and discussing coping strategies for the day-to-day -day mental health struggles that we might face. I won't be going too deep or into a lot of detail, but if you're triggered by any of those topics, then this video might be one to skip. So guys, I don't want you to think about this as a teaching video where I'm gonna be telling you how things are, but more of a sharing video uh, the goal of which is to open up a conversation about the cognitive functions and what we found to be helpful in regards to mental well-being based on whatever cognitive function that we happen to be leading with. So I'll start by sharing a little bit about my own experience. And I want to make it clear that this video is just my own personal experience, my own opinions. And I do not mean to claim that I understand what you guys are going through or know the answers to whatever it is that you might be going through. Again, I'd just like to open up a conversation and I believe that there is power in vulnerability. When the dreaded virus hit in 2020, I was suddenly forced to be still, as all of you were, I'm sure, as well. And as an ESFP who runs with dominant extroverted sensing, this was immensely hard for me. The life that I knew of parties, spontaneous road trips, chasing the next adventure, late nights, was finished for a time. Suddenly I was working and studying from home and I was hardly interacting with anyone. I'd wake up most days and just sort of stare into the void and just feel this immense unsatisfaction with my life and like I didn't want to face the next day. I was super bored and as a result I was forced to dive inward, which is not something that I have done for a lot of my life. I realized that when you're forced to be still, all that stuff that you're not recognizing or not giving yourself enough space or time to reflect upon or the stuff that you might be suppressing sometimes unknowingly can't help but make its way to the surface. And that's what happened for me during 2020. I started having physical bodily reactions to all this stuff that I'd been suppressing that was suddenly making its way to the surface and that I was forced to stare at right in the face. After I think 10 days of lockdown, Yes, that's how fast the unravel was. The mental health decline had been so steep and I was so overwhelmed that I made the decision to pick up the phone and book an appointment with a psychologist for the first time in my life. What began that day was an incredible journey of self-discovery, of self-acceptance and of rewiring those neural pathways that had been making my brain believe all of these lies and ultimately just immense healing that I didn't even know that I needed. We dove into so many things that I had no idea I even needed to talk about. And the very act of talking about them was exactly what I needed um, because I'm an external processor and I don't know whether that's to do with my SE or my TE, but we'll get to that a bit later in the video. So I spent a year with my psychologist um, going in every fortnight, sometimes every week um, and unpacking everything. And earlier this year, we both made the decision that I was doing really well and that I didn't need to come back 
for now. <laughs> when I look back at the state of my mental health two years ago compared to now, the amount of freedom that I feel, the amount of pride that I take in who I am and what I've come through is unparalleled. At that time, I was still weighed down by these desires to fit into these boxes of who I believe people wanted me to be or needed me to be. I had behaviors that were unhealthy, not just for me, but for others in my life. I had self-esteem issues that were based on just straight up lies that my brain was making me believe. And I was still holding on to just so many things from my past. But the biggest lesson that I learned, which was immensely freeing to learn, is that I am not those behaviors, those harmful behaviors that I used to have. I'm not them. I am not the lies that my brain is telling me. Those behaviors and those lies are merely a result of what was going on underneath the surface. And when I addressed that, the root of everything, that's when the veil was lifted and the smoke cleared. Now, even though I'm far from perfect, I rejoice at how much clearer I can see things. I rejoice over how much control I have over my decisions at how much more detached I am from other people's expectations and how much more autonomous I feel. And I'm now going through a slow process of facing the wrongs of my past and making decisions today that prove that I am not a slave to those behaviors anymore. So on my YouTube channel, it's quite clear that comedy is my comfort zone. It's my happy place. It's what I enjoy doing. But it was inevitable, of course, that my FI values would make their way into some of my videos. <laughs> and one of the things that I am most passionate about, um, which now maybe you understand just a little bit more about, is taking care of mental health. I believe very strongly that each one of us has an unfathomable amount of worth and that we were all we are all capable of being good loving human beings but you know life gets in the way and the world gets us down and situations happen in our lives that cause us deep psychological and emotional wounds and that's a part of life and that's that's okay but i want you to know that even when life gets hard and even Though sometimes it might feel that you're completely weighed down by those things and you don't have the strength to go on. Your inherent worth does not decrease because of those factors. And who you are is not defined by whatever behaviors you might have had in the past or have now that are harmful or toxic. The behaviors themselves might not be good, but they are not an indication that you are inherently a bad person. They are merely an indication that there is something greater, deeper going on beneath the surface, which is fine and normal. Not a single one of us is perfect and not a single one of us is above taking care of our mental health. So I wanna start a conversation with you guys. Now, I don't claim to be your therapist and I don't claim to have the answers to whatever it is that you might be going through. This isn't the medium for that. I'm here to provide a platform for discussion of those day-to-day -day coping mechanisms so as to bring all of this to your attention for the sake of your contemplation. We talk a lot about cognitive functions on this channel, which obviously have something to do with the brain. So, <laughs> nice one, Kristen. Therefore, they are relevant when talking about mental health. What I'm curious about and hoping to start a conversation around is linking various coping strategies, mindfulness techniques, and general mentalities that people find successful to specific cognitive functions that they might be using most of the time. So what are some helpful strategies that you guys have used to relax, unwind, ground yourself, deal with those negative feelings when they arise, or whatever it might be? And do you think that this has something to do with your leading cognitive function? I mean, we know that the fact that we're all leading with different cognitive functions means that we need different things in day-to-day -day life. We get our energy from different places because of that leading, that difference in leading cognitive functions and different things fulfill and sustain us. So why would coping strategies be any different? What does that look like? Well, I'm gonna share a little bit about my experience as an ESFP and what has helped me to deal with those kinds of negative emotions or feelings that might arise. And I hope that you guys will feel encouraged if you want to share your own pointers and experience in the comments below. Please be aware that even though I encourage you to share and I'm sure we all want to help each other, I can't guarantee a reply to your comment, not just from me, but from anyone. And obviously you're responsible for whatever you post. So please take a moment to consider that before you might post anything that is potentially really vulnerable. I'll also be deleting any comments that I deem to be inappropriate or insensitive. So please be mindful of your words when you're posting. Also, if you prefer not to share, 
that's fine too. And I hope that you're getting something out of this video regardless. So the things that I have found helpful as an ESFP include number one, actually make time to be still as an SE user. That's that means extroverted sensing as an extroverted sensing user. It is important to recognize that your real world is based on externals in the tangible world. So you don't, you're just naturally not going to be prone to as much introspection. And you might think that you are, but there is potentially a whole world that you have yet to discover about yourself within yourself. And that's okay because as long as you make the time to sit down and reflect, you will be fine. For me, I like to sit down where there are a few distractions, usually with a journal so that there's some mode through which I can externally process my feelings and thoughts. I like to write down my thoughts and feelings in a very straight to the point way. So for instance, what is this feeling that I'm currently experiencing? Can I identify where that is coming from? How is that manifesting in the external world? Is it in a helpful way or is it in a harmful way? Is this feeling consistent with reality or is it based on a lie that I might be telling myself? I know it's hard to sit down and be still as an ESFP, but thankfully there are apps like Voss for us to take with us on the go. Number two, externally processing. As an SE user, we value those experiences in our tangible reality. So talking about things physically with someone else can help us to form pleasant associations with the emotions or experience that we might be going through. Also actually verbalizing or writing about our feelings or experience can make them more real to us, which is important for recognizing the weight of that particular experience or emotion and therefore working out what the effects of that might be. This is also great for bonding in relationships through the physical experience of sharing with another human being. And this can help with relieving stress in the moment because we are creating a new positive experience in our physical world. Number three, learn to temper that natural desire to open up to anyone and everyone and rather find those few people who you trust. ESFPs tend to wear their hearts on their sleeves, which means that we want to share with anyone who shows us interest. This can actually disturb our inferior NI because it's screaming at us to be more prudent and careful with our sharing <laughs> because it knows the consequences long-term. So I found that when I was more liberal with my sharing, <laughs> she said, releasing a video to the internet, I was left with this sort of dull disturbance within me that was not okay with the fact that I couldn't keep track of what I'd shared with whom and the fact that I might have misjudged what to share in the moment or like, oh, what does this person think of me now? Etc. Etc. Remember that as ESFPs, we're all about the feelings and the experience. So we just want to share a new positive, pleasant experience with the new person that we've met by telling them about our feelings and our life. But we can become desensitized to our own feelings if we are not treating them with the respect that they deserve. I've learned that emotional prudence is a virtue and I've actually become much better at listening to that NI and processing my feelings by myself since I stopped oversharing and instead trusted my heart to just those few trusted people in my life. And I feel more settled and at peace because my inferior function and I is happy, <laughs> which is what you want. Number four, if you have an unpleasant memory arise or a new unpleasant experience, contradict that with a pleasant, tangible bodily experience. For instance, I had some unpleasant memories arise when it was the anniversary of a date on which a particularly hard experience had happened in my life. So I actively chose to make new pleasant bodily experiences on that day so that I would associate that date with those new experiences rather than the old ones. One of my friends was actually super sweet and beautiful and planned like a whole day full of activities. Um, and now every time I think about that date, I think about those things. It's not that simple. There was of course a lot of emotionally pr emotional processing that I had to do about that first experience. Um, but now that date is no longer an issue for me. In a similar way, if I have an unpleasant memory associated with a particular place, I'll make new memories in that particular place. And this can apply to a whole variety of things. As SE users, we place great value on bodily experiences. So engaging in a tone shift in our physical reality can make a world of difference. And it's immensely fruitful to acknowledge the power that our physical reality has in influencing our mind and emotions and to use that knowledge to confirm the reality 
rather than believing those lies that our brain might be trying to tell us. There is of course so much nuance to that, but this has honestly been one of the greatest lessons that I've learned in terms of taking care of my mental health. So guys, there is so much more that I could say about this topic, um, but I'm going to stop it there because this isn't just about me. This is about you guys as well. What are some helpful strategies that you guys have used to ground yourself, relax, to process what, or whatever you might be going through? And do you think that this has anything to do with your leading cognitive function? I've shared a little bit about how I think being an SEFI user has influenced my methods of coping with those mental health struggles that arise on the day to day and I would love to know your experience with this and any tips that you have to share with the wider audience. If you have got anything to share, would love to hear from you in the comments of this video and if it's relevant, please include your particular type, your MBTI type or your leading function and your auxiliary function in the first line or so of your comment just so that it's easier to find for those who might be leading with the same function or the same type as you. Remember, there are a lot of things to do with mental health that we don't have control over. But what we do have control over is making that decision to talk to someone, to talk to that friend, to contact that therapist. Remember that who you are is not defined by your behaviors. It is good to recognize the behaviors that we have done and to contemplate those and reflect on those, but you don't have to hold on to or define yourself by those behaviors that you've done in the past. Behaviors are a result of what is going on underneath the surface and processing those things can turn us into our better selves. I have faith in you guys. Thank you for watching this video.